Today, I quickly want us to look at uh, receiving the end of your faith. Receiving the end of your faith. Glory to God. We're going to go in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith. The salvation of your souls. I want us to understand, people of God, when it comes to functioning in faith or by faith, when it comes to the operation of faith, faith in terms of receiving on earth here, in terms of being able to access the promises of God. Let's say you are trusting God for a, for finances, or you are trusting God for a car, or are trusting God for healing, you are trusting God for a breakthrough. The Bible is telling us that we should receive the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We are going to get to that later. But I want us to look first how the Bible is to bring out to the place of understanding that not only God wants us to initiate ourselves or to enroll ourselves in this school called faith, He also wants us to enjoy the end of this particular initiation. Meaning, if you are trusting God for a car, you are trusting God for a house, you are trusting God for whatever, the Bible says that God, it is God's desire here for us to receive the end of our faith. Meaning, if you are trusting God for a car, God wants you to get a car. If you're trusting God for a house, God wants you to get a house. If you're trusting God for whatever, God wants you to receive the end of your faith. In terms of operating in the faith, in terms of uh, uh, doing business or transaction in the kingdom of God, in terms of faith. I want us to understand that God wants us to receive, here the Bible says, the end of our faith. Now, I want us first to begin to look at the, if we are going to receive the end of our faith, where does faith begin and where does it end? Let's say you are trusting God for finances. Where do you begin? Now, faith begins, as I said last week again, faith begins where the will of God is known. So for us to begin to operate in faith or by faith, first of all, we need to find out, we have to discover what is the will of God for that particular thing we are looking for. And when we, we establish the will of God and we know the mind of God and we say, okay, this thing, it is God's will for me to receive it. And then we engage our faith so that we can travel on the path of faith, faith until we reach the end of our faith, which is the manifestation or the reception or walking the reality of that which you are trusting God for. Now, if you look at the book of First John, we read this already. I'm kind of recapping. In First John chapter 5, verse 14, it says this. Now, this is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. I want us to notice the people of God that before we begin to petition, before we begin to ask God, God give me this, God give me that. First thing you have to establish that it is within the will of God for you to receive that. And for you to know the will of God, you must know the word of God because the will of God is found in the word of God. So if I don't know the word of God, it will be hard for me to find the will of God. I remember the story of a lady who believed that Kenneth Copeland, I heard a story of a lady who believed that Kenneth Copeland was, was meant to be her husband. So what she did, now Kenneth Copeland was already married. So she even had a, a, a wedding. She married Kenneth Copeland in the spirit. And then she was praying for her, for his wife to die so she can marry Kenneth Copeland. You see, prayer like that is not within the will of God. 
So you cannot begin to, to travel or to function or to operate by faith, trying to get to the end of your faith in terms of receiving that. Because what she was asking for, it was on the will of God. First of all, we need to establish faith begins where the will of God is known. No, first of all, is this thing in the will of God or no? When you get that, and secondly, you must ask. You must do what? You must ask. Now, you know, when I, many years ago, I used to wonder to myself, God knows my need. Why should I ask? Well, God wants us to ask. Even though he, he knows your need, he knows the desire of your heart, he knows your thought, he knows my thought, yet God wants us to ask. Look at this in the book of uh, John chapter 14, verse 13 to 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now notice the Bible says, whatever you ask in my name. So we can ask God for anything. We can ask God for, for healing, for relationship, for em your emotions, for your sexuality, for whatever you want to ask, you can ask. You know, it was early, I don't know, last month or so. My wife and I had a, I call it theological debate. Because I kind of didn't believe you can ask for money. I thought, no, you don't ask for money, just sow a seed and trust God. So my wife will say, looking at the scripture, she said, look what the Bible says. The Bible says, whatever you ask in my name. Whatever. So what does whatever mean? Whatever mean everything included. So you can ask God, if they say whatever, God, Jesus didn't say whatever you ask in my name except the money. Now, I, you know, I had my own way of looking at it and, you know, anyway, I don't want to go there. But I believe you can, I, then I came to the conclusion this week, I've been thinking about this for a while. I thought to myself, my wife is all right. Whatever means whatever. So you can ask God for whatever. If you have a problem, you can ask God for it. But notice the Bible says, whatever you ask in my name. So when we pray, we, we ask in the name of Jesus. Why is that we have to ask in the name of Jesus? Remember when I was talking about the covenant, I told us already that in the covenant, there are terms and conditions, there are beneficiaries, and there is also a covenant representative, the one who introduces you to that particular covenant. Well, we are in the new covenant. The new covenant, the Bible tells us, I believe in, in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, that there is no other name that was given to us by which might be saved under heaven here by the name of Jesus. So Jesus now is the covenant representative when it comes to to this new covenant. So when we come to us, we ask in the name of Jesus. But I want you to know this. When you ask, the Bible say that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Notice that the Bible says that when we ask, the Father is glorified in the Son. So God gets glory when you, we come to the end of our faith. God gets glory if you've been trusting God for something yet and then you receive it. God get, God is glorified. God is exalted. God is, is praised in your life. Why? Because when you receive, you receive the end of your faith. When you receive the answer to prayer, you give God the opportunity to boast among the nations. Because people might be wondering, well, people are dying of this sickness. People are dying of diseases. People are dying of lack or whatever is the case. But you prayed, you ask in the name of Jesus, and you got healed. You got delivered. You got, you got, you got a breakthrough. Guess what? Because the, your, your faith now, in the eyes of the nations, God is glorified. People even will be will desire to get to know this God. Who is this God? You can defy cancer. You can defy hepatitis, CBA. You can defy poverty and lack. You see, God now is glorified. Why? 
because you have received the end of your faith. Glory to God. You know, when I was thinking about this, I noticed something, people of God, is that most of the time, you know, no, no. when I, I meditate about things like this, I think about, I think about this thing in terms of my own personal life, the way I approach life. I don't know about you, but I realize most of the time, let me just include all of us. We don't ask. We wish over things. We worry over things. We think over things. But if we think about it, you, you have right now, let's say you have a situation in your, in your life. You notice you, there is no day you knelt down and say, God, I'm praying for this, my son. Father, I'm asking for peace. Father, I'm, we just get, you know, we complain. We say, this uh, boss of mine or this friend of mine or this, my body, my my you know, my, my head or your health, whatever is the case. I mean, we talk about things, but we never ask. We whinge about things, we never ask. We whine about things. We, you notice something. Sometimes we tell the whole world about circumstances, our situation, but we never tell God. Then we say to ourselves, God knows. God doesn't know. He knows that you have that situation, but he wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. You see, that's why sometimes we get, we get stranded. We, 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 we get stuck. We, we struggle because we're in a relationship with this God. Yes, we want to meet our need, but we don't take time to sit down and say, you know what? I'm going to cast my burden to Jesus because Jesus cares for me. Now look at this James chapter four, verse two. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Notice that the Bible says you do not have because you do not ask. People of God, we must ask. The Bible says, Matthew 7, 7, common scripture, ask and you will receive. Ask, you receive. Jesus said, whatever thing you ask in my name. So we have to ask in the name of Jesus. Glory to the living God. No complain. No tell the whole world how bad the situation is. No tell the whole world how hard is the situation is. Just ask God, God, this is my problem. I'm asking in the name of Jesus. I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. Glory to God. I wanted to notice something here in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 4 to 6, in terms of asking. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Look at that. This is what we do. Now, the problem here, they wanted meat. Now, let me just start by this. The Bible said they mixed, a mixed multitude, a mixed multitude. Remember, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it was not only the, there were also other nations who believed Moses when they saw the signs and wonders, they were willing to follow them where they were going to. So this was kind of a mixed multitude and many people came along with them. It was because of this mixture and these people came, started talking, you know, in Egypt we were better off and in this place we are dying, there is no food. And instead of just coming, and this is what most of us do, instead of just coming say, God, we need meat. God, I need a job. God, I need a wife. God, I need children. God, I need increase. God, I need a turnaround. God, I need a blessing. Instead of asking, no, we complain. And guess what? That was challenging God. Because what they were telling God is like, okay, you can look after us. Pharaoh did a better job. You should, like, that's an insult. You should have left us in Egypt. That's an insult in the face of God. Is a result now God judged them. Glory to God. So we have to come to a place whereby we don't complain about things. You ask, God, we need meat. It's like you have children. Can you imagine you have a child in the house? Instead of just coming, mom, we need milk. Dad, we need milk. He comes, he starts saying, in this house, 
we're just going to die of anger, hunger. I mean, we don't know that nobody can buy milk for us. Nobody buys cereal for us. This house is terrible. I mean, as a parent, how do you feel? It's the same thing with God. God say, no, don't wish, don't whine, no complain, just ask. But you notice something there, the Bible said to the mixed, don't forget that, a mixed multitude. Those people, sometimes when you want to walk by faith, you need to be careful who you are mixing yourself with. Because there are certain things, certain people, you are trusting God for this. And they will come and they start talking anyhow. They start telling you, oh, this will never happen. Oh, forget it. It's a result now. It affects your faith. And instead of receiving the end of your faith, you are stuck somewhere and you fail to receive a result in your life. Glory to God. So when it comes to receiving the, the, the end of our faith, we begin by identifying the will of God. We know what, uh, if it's God's will for us, we ask. But how do we ask? We ask in faith. In faith. We ask in faith. Look what the Bible says in uh, uh, James chapter 1 verse 6 to 7. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubt is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let no that man suppose that we receive anything from the Lord. Glory to God. So we are asking, how do you ask? You ask in faith. You ask in faith. It means that when you ask, you believe that God is going to do what he promised in his word. You believe that God is not a man. God's not going to lie. That's why before you start the journey, remember, know the will of God. Locate that word in the Bible. Find where the, the chapter and the verse and you say, God, you promise here that if I trust you here, this is what's going to happen. And then you begin to, to ask. And when you are asking, the Bible says a double-minded person is unstable. So if you are, let, let me ask in, in faith, no doubting. For he who doubt is like, a, is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he receive anything from the Lord. In other words, if you, we ask from the Lord today, and we so can ask, I trust God, God is going to do it. And then tomorrow come out, I don't know that's going to happen. And tomorrow say, God's going to do it. And what you are doing, you are up and down. The Bible says you are like the wave tossed by the sea. You know how the, you go to the beach, boom, the wave will come and then it, it dies. Another one comes, it dies. And the Bible says you never receive anything from the Lord like that. So when we ask something in faith, we hold on to our confession we believe God is going to do it. We trust God and we change our attitude. We begin to, to act in regard to that word. We begin to, to act in direct, in the direction of the things we are trusting God for. If it's a job, we start acting as we, we already have a job. If whatever. So that is faith. You begin to act in the direction of the things you are asking for. Glory to the living God. So I want us now to begin to look at people of God. Between the time you ask and the manifestation, you must be active in your faith. You must keep on speaking. You can, must keep on trusting God. Look at this. So I really want to read this. Very, very, very important. What I'm trying to tell us is that when you start, you start, you begin your faith in terms of operation. You ask to the delivery, don't give your faith rest. Don't now say, okay, I'm trusting God for a job, I sit there. No, you keep speaking, you keep trusting God, you keep, uh, you know, keep putting application, you, you, you are active in your faith, you active, you don't give up until you receive the end of your faith. Now look at that, this is very powerful, Luke chapter 17, verse 5 to 8, it says this, And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea. It will obey you. And which of you, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down 
to eat. But will he rather not say to him, prepare something to, uh, prepare something for my supper and get yourself and save me till I have eaten and drank and after all you, you will eat and drink. Now what did you notice here? They asked Jesus by the disciple, increase our faith. Now Jesus are telling them, no, you know, if you have a, 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 a faith like mulberry tree, mustard seed, mulberry tree, you can say to this mountain. Then he tell them, if you have a servant, did this a word servant or a slave? He said, if you have a slave, those days they used to have slaves. And then the slave comes from the farm. You send a slave from the farm and you are the master. You are staying at home. You are not going to tell the slave, okay, sit down. When you eat, you drink, you have rested. Then you can, you can serve me. No. Jesus said, he's your slave. You can tell him, okay, now, you, you came from the farm. That's fine. I want you now to cook for me. Let me eat. I want to drink. I'm down. Then you can have something to, to drink and eat. So Jesus who was talking about, he was giving this parable or he was giving this example, responding to the question that the, G, the disciple asked him, but increase our faith. So Jesus was telling them, what you need, what you need is not the bigger faith, just the small faith. But when you have that small faith, don't give it a rest. He's calling faith a slave. The faith is there to serve you. Faith is there to serve me. You don't give your faith a rest until it has delivered to you the desires of your heart. You know, the most, the most difficult time in faith is between the time you ask or the beginning of the faith and the end of faith. In between there. Is the hardest. You know, sometimes people come to, I can come to you, I can tell you, you know, sister, you know, brother, I had hepatitis A, B, and C, and the Lord healed me. And you say, wow, God, God is awesome, God. But I just, I'm just telling you that in two minutes or three minutes. But it was not like that. <laughs> I had to go to the doctor. They told me this. I came back and I went to the doctor. And the doctor said, we already had the treatment. We already had the, we already made it, had the, uh, the exams. We told you already, you are wasting our time. I said, please, no, you're wasting our time. I said, no, please, I want another test. They gave me another test, the same result. I said, see, you see, we told you. You see, all that sometimes I won't tell you. I, I didn't tell you the fact that one day I got so discouraged. I said, let me just go with the, you know, they treat people. I went there, I saw all these people, all of them were yellow. I said, I'm going to be like this. I mean, I, I don't, so the, it was so many things in between, but you just heard, it, you just heard the testimony. I had this and I'm healed, but you don't know in between. So in between there, that's where a lot of people fail. That's where a lot of people, they abort their miracle, they sabotage their destiny, they reject the plan of God for their lives, they, they despise the, the agenda of the, the agenda of God over the assignment God has for them. So I want us to understand people, God, in between there, what are you going to do from the big, from the beginning to the end of faith? In between there, just begin to praise God. Look what the Bible says. I love this. Romans 4.20. Talking about Abraham. The Bible said this, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Another word, giving glory to God was worshiping God. You see, praise and worship is the highest expression of your faith. Because when I'm worshiping God, what I don't, I have not yet received the result. What I'm saying, God, I'm dancing already because I know you're going to do it. I'm dancing already because I'm banking on your faithfulness. I'm banking on your character, your integrity. So what happened to our father Abraham? The Bible says he would, he did not grow weak in faith. He did not wave. He was not double-minded. He did not, no, he held into his confession. How did he hold onto his confession? By praising God. So when the devil begins to attack your mind, you say, it will never happen. You just are singing, I serve a very big God. He's always by my side. Oh Lord, 
By my side, by my... You say, Father, I know you are the Alpha and the Omega. You sent your word, you healed me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, not of this disease. I serve because the devil will come because he want to rob from you. He want to bombard you with thoughts, bombard you with confusion, bombard you with all sorts of things. You have to learn. That's why it is so important that you begin with the word. Because this is the word that you're going to be speaking in between. From the time you began to the manifestation. So don't give your faith rest like Jesus said to the, uh, the in that parable. He said, tell the, the, the slave, go cook for me. Go do this. It means that I send my faith there. Do this do, until it may, makes a delivery. I'm not going to give faith. I'm going to, I'm not going to give my faith rest until it delivers that which God has promised. Glory to the living God. Now, I want us to know this, this. The scripture we read, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls. Now, I want us to know this, this. The ultimate, the ultimate of faith The, the major focus of our faith should be focusing on Jesus. Now, we want to trust God for breakthroughs. We want to trust God for a turnaround. We want to trust God for finances, for healing, for all that. But we need to understand that Jesus is the the root of faith, as we said last time, is also the end of faith. So it's the one who's gonna, who give you, he gives you that faith. The one who sustains you in that faith is the one also who's gonna manifest that which you are trusting God for. That's why Hebrew chapter 12, uh, verse 2, it says this. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your our faith, who for the the who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and they sat down at the right hand of the of the throne of God. Glory to God. So the Bible said that Jesus is the ultimate, is the very reason. Why we have faith is the reason why we're going to receive the manifestation of our faith is the, is the, is the target, is the focus of our very faith. Now, you know why is Jesus supposed to be the ultimate? You need to listen to this. Why would Jesus supposed to be the ultimate of your faith? Why? Listen to these people of God. It's because, you see, in this world we are living in, we are going to trust God for a lot of things. Trust God for breakthrough. Trust God for a turnaround. Trust God for whatever people trust God for. And the Bible says, as we read, whatever thing we ask in the name of Jesus is going to do it. But let me tell you something. Even though we live by faith, even though we trust God, even though God is faithful, but we need to understand that we are operating by faith in a fallen world. So, as much as we can receive the word, as much as we can trust God, there will be situations, circumstances Regardless of our faith, that might not make sense to you. You must say to yourself, ah, Apostle say I should trust God. And I should get the word. I get the word, I trust the God, but she didn't receive the end of my faith. And you become disappointed. That's why the end of the faith, the Bible says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And salvation comes through Jesus. Another word 
Yes, I want to receive whatever I want to receive on this earth through faith. But my focus is not necessarily what I can receive. My focus is on Jesus so I can see him one day. So the ultimate of faith is to see Jesus one day. The ultimate of faith is to enjoy Jesus one day. I'll tell you people, God, there will be things in this world. Personally, things I've prayed for, i cried, i so sick. I said, God, I need a turn around this situation. Situation still did not turn around. Not necessarily you did something wrong or your faith doesn't work. Yeah, you have faith, but it, certain things just don't want make sense. It's like it reminds me of that man who was, you know, who was born blind. The disciples came to Jesus. Well, why would this man born blind? Did his mother, father sin? Jesus said, oh, it's not his mother, father. He's just born blind for the glory of God. I mean, you know, we can debate and so on. Oh, the glory of God was for him to see. Either way, that man was born blind. So even Jesus didn't say, well, he born blind. There was no proper explanation, if not the glory of God. Certain things, they won't make sense to us. And you need to say to yourself, you know what, if they don't make sense to me, my, the ultimate to my faith is Jesus. One day I will see Jesus and I will understand. You know, it reminds me of uh, my wife and I, we know uh, this man, a wonderful man, a man of God, a man of integrity. He fears God. And this man and his wife, they trusted to, you know, they wanted to have children. Never had children their whole life. And this man went to be with the Lord. He died. Was it last year? This year or last year? No, last year. A pastor, great church. I mean, if you go to his house, you see. I know God gave him his spiritual children. I mean, you when we were there, we just see daughter and sons, people are coming, being a blessing. But you can just see his wife heartbroken. That was when he, the husband was still alive. So you there are a lot of reasons. You you can quote scriptures. The Bible says there will never be any barren among you. Be, you can quote sometimes your life will be a contradiction of the word. The Bible says one thing, and my life. How come? Why? There are certain things because we live in a fallen world. The devil is here and we, we know in part, we understand in part. Certain things God won't even have time to explain to you. you. You just have to live like that and Jesus must be the ultimate of your faith. Because if only in this life, look what the Bible says actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19. It says this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Some versions say, if we uh, if only in this life we have a hope, we're going to be miserable. Another word, God is telling us, yes, you can operate by faith. Yes, faith can open a door. Yes, by faith you can conquer victory. But if you want your faith to function just while you are here, you're going to be miserable. Because there are big things like you just like say, you know what? I've done everything. That's why the Bible tells us the book of Ephesians. After you've done everything to stand. Stand. And sometimes I used to say myself, oh God, what, how long you want me to stand for? God will keep on standing until you get what you are waiting for. If you don't get it well, you stand until Jesus comes. Glory to God. So I want to understand people, God, there will be, there will be just things, there will just going to be things. That won't make sense to you. You things that just break your heart, you don't understand. You fast, you pray, nothing changes. You sow a seed, nothing changes. You know, my wife and I know a man of God, good friend of ours, very sick right now, almost dying. The wife almost dying. Great church. Now you are wondering, God, I was talking to this man of God, my heart will just. So shaken, moved. What is this? What is this? Things just happen. Sometimes you can't explain them. Sometimes, yeah, I have a faith, a faith, a man of faith. But I tell you what, I've seen great things with faith. I've also things I've not understood. 
I remember when I was 12 years old, my uncle was dying. And uh, my mom was crying a lot because this is his brother and she was crying all the time. My heart was so moved for my mom. I said, oh God. So what I did, I was 12 years old. I started fasting. I was fasting, I was fasting. And because I, I heard like if you fast and you pray, God, you will do something. I fasted. When I just finished my fasting, the news came. Your, your uncle passed away. My mom cried over her brother for like, oh my God. To this day, I don't think my mom has recovered. I mean, it has been when I was 12. Then I thought to myself, I prayed. I believe they say if you ask in the name of Jesus. I even, on top of it, I put fasting. He still died. To this day, I don't understand what, what happened. People can say whatever you explain, but he died. Okay? I had faith. Because I didn't have faith, I wouldn't be going to those mountains as a 12 years old go to pray. I went there. Nothing happened. You see? So what I'm trying to tell us, Jesus should be the ultimate, the focus of our faith. You know why? Because, yes, we want to use our faith for the things of the world. And the reason I'm saying this is because of our faith is being interpreted and our faith being taught today. Because I begin to realize today faith, is, the end of faith is all about receiving something, receiving my breakthrough, receiving my turnaround. But I want us to understand that even though you don't receive your turnaround, you have to consider yourself as if you are a traveler. You are a passenger here on earth. Actually, look at this first Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says this, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lust, which war against the soul. Now, when I read in the NLT, so you can understand properly, look at this. NLT says this, Dear friend, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Now, I want to read it in an easy English version so you can understand properly. Look at this. It says, My friend, remember that you are really strangers in the world. You do not belong here. So I'm telling you not to do the bad things that your bodies may, may want to do those bad things fight against what is good for your soul. People of God, what I'm telling us, yes, we have faith. Yes, we trust God. But there are just going to be things sometimes, your heart just going to be in pain because of what you did not receive. It's not just because you did not receive them, does not mean something wrong with you or you do not have faith. Sometimes there is no real explanation over what has just happened. Now, I want us to read this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. And if you know the book of Hebrews 11 is the chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter of faith. And the Bible calls them the heroes of faith. The heroes, the champion of faith. Now, look what the Bible says about them. It says this. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, these people, the Bible calls them the heroes of faith, the champion of faith, faith, men and women of faith. But the Bible says what? They died in faith. They did not receive the promise. They just saw them from far. They embraced them. They just knew God is faithful. You know what sustained them? The Bible says because they consider themselves, they were strangers here. They were pilgrims. They were passengers. So it didn't matter if they received them or no, because Jesus was the, the ultimate of their faith. And most of us, we are, be, we are becoming discouraged because you want everything just to be fulfilled in this world. No, you are in the world. We are in the world. We are not of the world. 
Glory to God. Now, as we are coming to a close, I want us to look at the, the life of Joseph. And I know I, I repeat this all the time because really to me this is very inspiring. In, uh, in Genesis 5, 50 verse 25. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So here is Joseph now. Joseph is dying. God gave them a promise. When he was dying, he didn't say, oh no God, this is such a waste of my life. I've given my whole life for this thing. I thought it's going to work and nothing has worked. No. He, he said to he, he said to the children of Israel, God will visit you. If God visits you, take my bones from here. Another word, the faithfulness of God is bigger than my life. My life has been short, but the faithfulness of God is bigger, is greater. So the faithfulness of God would outlive my life even on earth. Glory to God. And he gave them, he said to them, listen, you have to carry me from here. So what I'm saying, sometimes it's possible you are living a life of broken dreams and fulfilled desires. Living a life with uh, some, some thought, something you thought it should be realized, did not realize. So you should not be discouraged. Be like apostle, be like Joseph. You know what? God, I know it, you, know, it, it, you did not fulfill it in my time. That's why I have children. My children are my seed. If you don't have biological children, your spiritual children will see it. So we need to know that God is a faithful God. And the reason these men and women, they could bank on God like that, because they knew the character of God. Look what the Bible says. This one of the best scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. He says this. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. God is full of faith. So when we come to God, either we receive what we are trusting God for, or we don't receive what we are trusting God for, either God life makes sense, does not make sense, we need to understand the ultimate of our faith is Jesus. It's Jesus. And as long as we have not seen him yet, it's not over. Glory to God. See, that's what the Bible says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Yeah, we're going to receive stuff, but if you don't receive, you'll see Jesus. That's when things will make sense. That's when thing, you'll be able to understand things. I want us now very quickly, as we are closing now, to look at the life of Jacob and to see how painful life was for Jacob. In a book of... Uh, I don't want to read it. It's just going to take us very, it's very long. Remember how Joseph was sold in Egypt. We all know the story. And Jacob thought that his son Joseph died. And the Bible says Jacob was so bitter in his heart. It was such a great pain. He was crying. He said, I want to die with my son. I want to die. And all this pain and all this stuff, Jacob had to go through. He just thought Joseph was dead. In his mind, Joseph is dead. So he remained with that pain. You know how long Jacob was separated from Joseph for? 27 years. That's a long time. For 27 years, he was in pain. For 27 years, he thought this will never happen. Now, as I'm closing, I want to also encourage somebody because when I say, well, you know, you might, might live with a broken dream, dream, sometimes it's not necessary. You are not going to receive, you are not, you are, you, it's not that you are not going to receive it, but you might not receive it at the time you want to receive it. Sometimes God is working on you. Working in your character. Work. Sometimes you might be ready, but your wife is not ready. Sometimes you're ready, your husband's not ready. Sometimes you are ready, your children are not ready. Sometimes you are ready. I mean, there are a lot of things God has to put in place. So Jacob cried, cried. After 27 years, guess what? God brought him, Joseph, not like a boy, a man, who was a blessing to him. 
Joseph wiped away Jacob's tears and tears. Uh, Jacob, uh, Joseph wiped Jacob's tears. Jacob died and fulfilled a happy old man. Why? Because God had a plan for him. And even though he went through the time of pain, those pain was not wasted. So what am I saying? In conclusion, I want to say this. In Romans chapter 8 verse 28, the Bible said this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. People of God, as we are trusting God, as we have decided to walk by faith, I want us to understand. There will be things you will understand. There will be things you won't be able to understand. You'll be think, there will be things you will receive, some you won't receive. You will walk in the reality of your dream, some dream just will be broken dreams. You will be, you will receive some uh, good relationship. You people will love you. Some people reject you. It will be just a mixture of all things. But look at this. The Bible says we know, we know all things work together for good. Even though things do not make sense right now. The key there in that verse, he said, all things work together for good for those who love God. So we keep on loving God. I didn't get that job I trusted God for. I don't understand. I don't know. But Jesus, the ultimate of my faith. I love God. Lord, I trust you. I know you have a better plan for me. I did not get that job, but God, I have a plan for me. This man who rejected me, God, you have a plan for me. This woman who received me, God, you have a plan for me. God, I didn't receive that money when I, I thought I should receive. God, you have a plan for me. I mean, even when things they don't make sense, say to yourself, you know what? All things somehow is good for me. You know, it doesn't make sense. You know, this scripture, sometimes when I look at this, God, what do you mean? He said, all things work together. It means the good and the bad. If you love God, I tell you, believe me, you can ask the older people. Some of them, they are with us online. Ask them. They will tell you that there were things in their lives that made them cry. Things that they made them, you know, so discouraged, so heartbroken. But today when they look back, they say, you know what? Thank God I went through that. Thank God that person rejected me. Thank God I didn't get that job. Thank God that friend walked away from me. Thank God that person betrayed me. Thank God because if this person don't betray me, I will not have come to this place. I mean, imagine that if, jo if, if Jacob did not go through the 27 years of pain, you know what would have happened? During famine, he would have died. And uh, uh, Jacob, if, if Jacob did not go through the 27 years of pain or separation from his son. When the famine came, global famine, no food, people dying, selling everything, they were already in luck. What would have happened? He would have died and the 70 families he had, they all would have died. But guess what? It was painful, but when God worked it all to, out together, it was for their good. So I'm encouraging somebody today, remember, Faith is the key that gives you access to the life of wonders. Either you receive it or don't receive it. It's not about what you receive. It's all about Jesus. is the founder and the finisher of our faith. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we just want to bless your name. Your name is wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, Father, you are everything. You are the ultimate pursuit of our faith. want to give you glory today, Father, for your word. Your word is spirit. Your word is life. We will hold on to you, your word, Father, for he who promises is also faithful. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Glory to God.